and Anne Marie Bergen, who's on the California Teachers Advisory Council for CCST. We had a third team looking at um, water infrastructure in the state, and that was led by Jude Laspa, who was uh, formerly with Bechtel Group, his retired executive from there. The report's major findings are really looking at how we cultivate our entrepreneurial system, invest in our innovation assets, and then how we also use those innovation assets to um, a direct um, impact competitiveness, but also problems the state is dealing with, particularly that my colleagues have raised education and water, which were the two big ones. To come to these areas of expertise, we talked to thought leaders around the state, held several meetings, um, Southern and Northern California, and water and education consistently was raised as a huge issue in uh, job creation in the state. We can't expand without solving our water problem, and we don't have the workforce without solving the education problem. Um, the critical actions that this uh, study proposes or suggests is to um, leverage the existing science and tech and human resources in the state um, and then look at solving those problems. Uh, do we really need to focus on this or should we be focusing on tax credits? I'd say that on a per capita basis, see, uh, California is falling behind other states, and it's it's very dramatic. We're we're ranked 41st in science and engineering bachelor degrees awarded um, in the population of 18 to 24 year olds. So in the in this country, we are falling way behind our colleague states. We also rank seventh and 13th in high tech employment. So we talk about Silicon Valley and the importance of innovation here, but we are losing the ground that we've held on to for so long. Um, we're finding that looking at our doctorates measured as a ratio of population, we're now second to Massachusetts also in venture capital. Um, so we talk about uh, Page Mill and Sand Hill and, and where all that funding is, but it's in Massachusetts more than it is here now. So looking at our uh, state's budget challenges and looking at innovation and in the uh, potential in the state, um, CCST and its team of uh, working on this report uh, recommend a privately funded 501c3 not-for-profit corporation to take the lead in trying to do what we've been talking about, consolidate all these great ideas and these great uh, um, strategies and plans and come up with something that we can all get behind. And the something we're looking at is S&T, but all of the discussion here today is very vital to job creation in the state. We um, are looking at other states and nations that have similar private sector-led in initiatives. To give you an idea, North Carolina, which is one I think you would re recognize as quite competitive, Oregon, Ohio, and this one might surprise you, Bavaria. Um, so around the world and across this country, states are employing very rapidly their innovation capacity and integrating into plans and, and strategic actions. Um, we have three areas that we would do in an innovation initiative. Um, we would be looking at how to facilitate and ensure collaboration. And we would do that with um, several ideas, but the three that I want to mention to you. One is to look at a California Innovation Extension Service somewhat like an agricultural extension service that helped build agriculture in the state, but look at this as focused on innovation. And in this case, we could look at our research institutions, public and private in the state, and we can look at our federal labs, which may surprise you have um, more dollars invested in research in the federal labs in California than we do in our research universities in the state of California. So looking at an innovation extension service, develop a program that works with people to move ideas and actually people talent from those institutions that we're already investing in out into the job creation sector. And we would call that an extension service, innovation extension service. Another idea that we think needs to be looked at seriously is the California Innovation Index, a way to benchmark what we're doing compared to others. Um, Massachusetts does this. In fact, we've had conversations. Um, Doug Henton with Collaborative Economics has been working with us on this study. Looking at Massachusetts, can we actually even work with them? We're competing in one sense, but they're also looking at what's happening across the country and the world. So why don't we sort of team up a little bit and look at how we might create a benchmark together and start to see how this country and our states are comparing and what the kinds of things we're doing in the innovation capacity. The third I want to mention around innovation initiative would be uh, creating uh, communities of innovation. And we're watching some of these um, well, actually, across the world, you're seeing great investment by uh, governments in these communities of innovation in um, 
Other states are seeing great investment by that. In California, you're seeing efforts emerging, uh, more grassroots. One would be the Livermore Open Campus that our Sandia National Lab that's down in Livermore along with the Lawrence Livermore National Lab is <laughs> working to create um, a private enterprise on land adjacent to their lab working with the city of Livermore. Another one in the state is the NASA Ames Research Park in Mountain View. The efforts there with the universities, um, not just California universities, but others from around the country coming to take advantage of the talent and the ideas coming out of Silicon Valley and trying to build a research center. But communities of innovation, a place where it's not just about physical infrastructure, but it's about the interaction between um, people and ideas. And it could integrate that extension service idea into these communi communities of innovation. And again, we're seeing it across the country um, in the research park world, but not as aggressive here in California. But Taking these ideas, um, and if we can get folks around it, bring the stakeholders in, start to integrate some of this thinking, those kinds of ideas we think can help us push our innovation capacity forward and leverage our investment in the uh, research and engineering activities we also have. But we won't get very far unless we address these other two issues. One is education. Um, as you know how, f how far down the list we are in education. Um, in our studies, we're looking at how can California lead in the digitally enabled education. So if you're, my son is looking down at his lap right now, it might be because he has an iPad there. Mm -hmm. And what we're learning is how this generation really relies on the technology in a different way than we can even imagine, quite frankly. And some of the gaming that he does um, in a civilization game is teaching him more about history and economy than I've seen him learn in his classroom. So one of the things that we're proposing is that we really th rethink and create some pilots on how do you use the digital education technology capacity of this state, um, bring in the industry sectors who are interested in working with this, work with the teachers who would become more coaches than lecturers, and look at the classroom as an incubator and start to pull together a digital um, education initiative. Um, it would require, it would necessitate that we would have um, broadband access for all of our children, which is something I hope we actually should do regardless of whether we do this particular initiative, and um, that we make sure that we have um, the kids um, being considered sort of as digital natives start to take some clues from how they're using the digital um, and fast-paced other ways to do this rather than doing our old rote way of teaching. Um, the private sector uh, that we've talked to um, is interested in this because it helps create that market opportunity for them. So while we solve an education workforce issue, we can also help spur an industry in this area. Um, and again, the teacher would work with us as moving knowledge to f um, from knowledge to facts, is how we used to do it, to knowledge as product, where they start to work and coach the student. Um, and we propose in this uh, study that there be an innovation consortium, an education innovation consortium assigned to work on that. And again, that brings in the stakeholders, including the labor unions and industry. And we think that education initiative is absolutely critical. We're falling too far behind, and it needs to be done soon. The second infrastructure challenge is water. And this is something Mr. Shell pointed out um, early on, that we really need to meet the water challenges. And again, remember, my um, focus is from the science and technology-based perspective. We understand it's a very complex issue with many overlying jurisdictions mm -hmm. and, and regulations and laws. We're looking at what science and tech can bring to this discussion. And we're proposing a, a science and tech-based um, water innovation roadmap. CCST just completed something like this in, in energy um, and looked at the 20, uh, 25, 50 year time frame for energy and what technologies seem to be relevant. We're proposing we do something similar like that in water. And we look um, at the risks of the water system and the potential impacts and we uh, look for ways to um, integrate new technologies into solving those problems. 
again, uh, we think this can both solve a problem and help spur um, economic activity and job creation around the technologies related to that. We would have a roadmap include the development of realistic scenarios of supply and demand that we would look at a 10, 25, 50 year review of a view. We would start to look at what do we need to be doing now to meet those demands both uh, created by um, growth but also created by climate change and the shifting patterns in the state. Um, the the uh, roadmap would address things such as forecasting water availability, building resiliency to season and multi-year changes in our supply, reducing the water intensity of energy systems, which is one of our big, biggest water, um, energy, water energy uses, increasing the efficiency of water use and shirk water quality, developing uh, surface storage and groundwater recharge options, uh, monitoring, monitoring of groundwater use and restoring, of course, watersheds and habitats. And like education, we think this roadmap for water can help catalyze that private sector um, R&D product and services and make us globally um, more competitive in this area. Um, in fact, we started working with DWR on this discussion already and how they can integrate it into their 2012 plan. So just in closing, um, we're pleased that this committee is looking at these issues seriously, that the speaker has um, created a new select committee to look at this same discussion seriously, and the lieutenant governor is looking at it. But again, like the others at the table, we sort of urge some integration and in thinking through not of another plan, but of strategy and action. And what CCST is proposing to bring um, is the team of people, the action teams that have already been working on this um, study that we've given to you, and actually start to move forward and help implement some pieces of this that have an s and component. Um, so we look forward to working with you on that. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Uh, for purposes of time, we're going to go ahead and move forward, and I'll raise my questions uh, at the end. Um, my understanding is that we now have uh, Julian Canete, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, who is going to present it, and afterwards, uh, Mr. Stewart. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and first of all, let me thank you, um, your committee, past and present, uh, and of course, Tony Simons and, and Mercedes Flores, the uh, committee staff, for all the hard work you have all done in regards to small business. I think a few years ago, we uh, all got together. You said, I want to know what it's really like out there for small business, we told you. And you took that to heart and you hit the road running. And I think we've had some great accomplishments over the last couple of years in regards to enterprise zones just recently. Um, of course, you know, funding of our SBDC so they can service our small business and help them create jobs. So again, uh, first of all, let me give a big thank you to this committee and your commitment to small business as well as the other members, but thank you. Um, I'm gonna touch on a, probably three main points here. Uh, real quick, and, and, and they all have to do with, with basically how, how can we help small business create more jobs and help this economy grow. Uh, but first of all, you know, we met um, with the governor early on, uh, probably about back in April, and we did express our support that the state do a five-year economic development plan and put in place, and I think a lot of the work has been done by the JET Committee in regards to, you know, the economy and the recovery. Uh, that could be part of that plan, but we did stress to him the need uh, for that uh, five-year plan. Um, at the time, he was engrossed in bigger issues, uh, but he did seem uh, to want to talk more about it and, and bring together many of the small business organizations uh, throughout the state to continue that dialogue. So I just wanted to, to make sure we put that out there, um, that we, we, we have made that, uh, uh, that suggestion to the governor, as well as you know our support of AB 29, which we think uh, as a one-stop center for economic development is critical to this state. And I, I agree with, with Sarah that, you know, there needs to be that one-stop place where someone can go and say, where do I get help in A, B, C, and D? And they're all there. I think we have a good start right now in the go at office. They, they've been very successful. And, and I think in some of the rolling out the red carpet stuff that we've talked about, uh, we think AB 29 is a good start. Uh, we hope it passes. Uh, we're supportive of it. Uh, but also we want to see more of those economic development agencies that weren't addressed in the bill to eventually come under that, that go at umbrella. Three areas that, that the State Hispanic Chamber and, and many of my small business partners uh, feel that are important to small business creating jobs. The first one, access to capital. Uh, I know we worked hard in making capital available. Uh, the capital is now available through, whether it's through banks. Our banking partner says, we've got the money to land. Our, um, our community banking uh, organizations uh, 
uh, Valley Economic Development Corporation out of Southern California, who we work with as intermediary for many of our businesses, say we have money. And we're working to, to, to get that capital out there so businesses can grow and create new jobs, hire new employees, hire the equipment they need to create those jobs. But at the same time, we, we are seeing also, because of the economic crisis that we had, a need to make our businesses even more credit worthy because they've lost some, you know, they've lost some of that credit worthiness that they had in this last crisis. So again, I think uh, uh, an important fact is continued funding of the SBDCs as we've gotten in the past and hopefully next year as well so, so that we can start building that, those companies again so they, can, so they can access that capital. That is one issue we've been seeing there. Um, but again, building the capacity in our businesses and I think again, education programs, whether through the SBDCs, through our community colleges, through other organizations are important uh, to be funded as part of an, any economic development plan. Um, we talked about regulatory reform. And of course, you know, we've been on the forefront in regards to regulatory reform. We had a couple of bills that got kind of shelved there uh, that are in suspense. Uh, but again, we think this is an important component, again, of, of economic recovery and, and economic development. Um, a, a story that we, we, we shared uh, with the governor when we met him was a, 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 well, first of all, let me go back, is that because of some of the regulation, it's stifling some innovation. And, and some of our companies from going green because of this regulation. Good example, there's a, there was a company um, that in the Fresno, Lemoore area, they wanted to build a number of solar farms. Uh, they thought it was gonna take them about eight months to get through the regulatory process. It ended up taking them almost two years now and 120 state, federal, and local agencies, regulatory agencies, and they still have not, uh, you know, I. I I believe as of the last time we, we spoke to them, had not you know, uh, broken ground on the project. And, and, and these are projects that would bring you know, half, half a billion dollars into those communities as well, in jobs, in, in infrastructure, et cetera. So again, regulatory reform is important. And, and, and you know, we understand the need for regulation. There, there are protections that we think consumers and even businesses need, and, and we're not against regulation. We're just saying there has to be some common sense uh, to all of the, these regulations that are out there, that that they're looked at, that they're friendly to business. You know, we just heard that you know California is 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 you know we'll let them overregulate and overtax, and the businesses will come to us. We don't want to see that as a chamber. We don't want to see that as small businesses. Our businesses want to stay here. They want to continue to grow. But I, I truly think that that we need true uh, regulatory reform and and continued legislation that that assists us in those areas. And, and the third area has to do with our small and micro-owned businesses. And that's an area of procurement, state contracting. I, I, I think this is an important part of that whole economic development picture. Not, oftentimes we just let it fall to the wayside um, because it usually is a concern of, of a lot of the uh, minority women-owned small businesses, micro-businesses, disabled veteran businesses. But I think it's an important part of stimulating the economy as well. If we're encouraging our small businesses to bid on these contracts, and our state agencies are saying, we know our California small businesses and micro businesses can perform. We, you know, we're going to high speed rail, and we're talking about you know the opportunities that exist there. You know, are are we working to transfer uh, you know the technology uh, that our businesses need to know so they can participate in those high speed rail contracts? Uh, but overall, just just doing business with our California small businesses here, and encouraging even you know I think the the, the latest bill was going to be 25 percent small business uh, participation. You know, I, I think that should be greater, and you know, we're talking with the High Speed Rail Commission that, that even for them, you know, the largest infrastructure project coming to California, we should have higher goals there of, to have small business and micro business enterprise participation. Because you know, these are the businesses, and I don't have to give you a stat, you know them. Um, you know, these are the businesses that, that, that create jobs one at a time. But if you have 700,000 small businesses creating one job at a time every year. That's 700,000 new jobs that we've created. I mean, very simple uh, train of thought, but still. But it's because we're encouraging our state agencies also to say, hey, we need to do business with the small businesses because that continues to build them in those communities. You know, and that dollar gets spent right back into the community. It doesn't go back out to Texas, a firm from Texas coming in to do the contract, et cetera. So, so those are the, the three areas that, that we see are important to continue economic growth and economic development in California. Um, you know, we stand ready as we have in the past uh, to continue to work with you and the committee, uh, the governor, uh, the lieutenant governor who was at our 
our annual convention last week and, and uh, gave us his overview of, of economic development as well. So we look forward to growing this economy. I, I think we're starting to get there. We're, we're starting to see a, some traction, uh, but we want to see that you know, even more traction and continue to build. So I thank you for having us here today, um, and, and we look forward to working with you further. Thank you, Julian. I appreciate your presentation. And as I mentioned, because of purposes of time, I'm going to save my remarks and my questions to the end uh, till after our last speaker. So I guess uh, this is where we can say we save the best for last, Mr. Stewart. I hope so. <laughs> that's what that's that's why that's how, what I assumed when uh, Mercedes <laughs> told me I was going to be last on the agenda. All right. Um, you know, much. Well, I learned I was uh, doing uh, cleanup here. I was uh, a cleanup batter. I was realized that most of what I was going to say was all, would already be said by the time I got, it got to me, and that is a fact. Uh, I, let me just bring the urgency of this issue to you again. Um, two weeks ago I was at, uh, at the annual meeting of COSMA. COSMA is an organization you haven't heard of. It's a Council of State Manufacturers Associations, and it's a small group of 50 people, uh, the CEOs of the manufacturers of associations in the individual states. We get together once a year to talk about common issues, what's happening in your state, how are you addressing this. And the disappointing thing for me as I walked away and I listened to discussions from the other states was how aggressively other states have been moving to, uh, to improve their business climate, to improve their investment climate. At the beginning of this year, after last year's election, virtually every state, and especially the Midwest states, the Rust Belt states that, uh, that uh, have lost so many manufacturing jobs, have refocused their efforts on revitalizing their, their manufacturing uh, uh, industry, the sector of their economy. So I think that you know, what's happened here is now, and they're all looking at this fact that there's about, and the number varies depending on which news show you listen to, but something in the neighborhood of two to three trillion dollars of investment money sitting on the sidelines waiting for the economy to improve. Well, what's happened is, is 49 other states, or most of 49 other states, have looked at that and now are in a position that once that money starts flowing, once our economy starts to improve and we see that money start to flow into investments, they're prepared to, to, to accept those investments in their own states. California has really, from my perspective, done almost nothing this year. Here we are in the eighth month of our legislative session. Almost every bill that is heard in this committee and other committees we talk about jobs, and we put a high priority on jobs, but we're really not going to the core issues. CMTA had a, 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 a platform, an agenda of bills this year. Uh, right now, those bills are virtually all dead. Uh, regulatory reform is key among them, uh, and, and what we're seeing is, is at this time of the, uh, this time of the, the, the session, we're fighting. We're, we're doing offense rather than supporting bills that should be helping the economy. We're fighting bills that we believe will hurt the economy and hurt manufacturers in California. Uh, at the end of June, CMTA uh, sponsored a California Manufacturer Summit. It was a, uh, a two-hour roundtable uh, with uh, featuring business, uh, labor. Art Pulaski was there. Um, Mike Jimenez from CCPOA was there. Uh, showing that there is a developing cooperation between la labor and business, and I would, I, would, I would put that very high. I mean, Sarah took some comments here earlier, and I think that there, there is a growing realization that we need to do more to work together to find common solutions. We had government representatives there, Lieutenant Governor Newsom was there, um, Senator Bob Dutton was there, we had environmentalists there, we had uh, uh, venture capitalists there, all talking about manufacturing. And I think the high level, and what we were trying to do is the, the 50,000 foot agreement level, that manufacturing was key to, uh, to rebuilding California's economy. And we came away from that with that, with that, with that understanding. I have handed out to you the, uh, uh, what we call the vision document. It was, the, it was a program from that, from that uh, uh, summit, and we will update this again uh, with more direct recommendations that came out of the summit. I also want to talk about the Lieutenant Governor's uh, uh, economic development proposal. Now, I got to say, the Lieutenant Governor, and everybody has mentioned that, but I want to I emphasize it, is the first statewide leader in a dozen years who has addressed the importance of a cohesive economic development agenda for California. I applaud him for what he has done. I, I worked with him on, on, on developing the, uh, the, uh, the agenda, and I think that, you know, is there things in there that are not exactly what I would like? Yeah, but the fact is, it is a framework for us to start to work on. Nobody else has done that. Uh, this committee, I believe, needs to take a look at that 
and use that as a framework. And, and we talked earlier about bringing the generals together uh, to, uh, to figure out how we're going to do this. Well, you have now a framework for doing that, and let's, let's use that to make, to make sure that this is all going to, going to work. Um, I brought some slides with me. I, I haven't presented these to this committee before. I think there's a, a new set of SOT slides, and I wanted to make sure that I got them on the record here uh, for my co colleagues up here. I had this on uh, PowerPoint, but somehow it uh, got lost. One of the things we haven't really talked about very much, and I think it's where there is some commonality between labor and, and business right now, is the fact that our state budget is imbalanced and we cannot figure a way to do that. I put together this, this, this graph, uh, the top graph there, four decades of California manufacturing losses, looking at what has happened to manufacturing over a 40-year period. Basically, we've gone from 22 percent of, uh, of the workforce to uh, being manufacturers to 8.9 percent manufacturers. We've gone from 18.4 percent of our gross state product being manufacturing industrial output down to 11.9 percent. And I would say that when you look at that and you realize the revenue losses we lose from the, uh, from the uh, uh, income tax and corporate tax, there is a huge loss to the state. In fact, Milken Institute re re uh, uh, did a quick analysis and said just, just from the, the loss of middle class jobs in this state from 2000 to 2007, we, we, we realized a $5 billion a year revenue loss to the state from income taxes alone. So I think this is, this is, this is and, and the other thing I'd like to say is that about this is that we developed the current modern structure for California government during this period when we had a growing industrial sector. And California became dependent on that, and our government became dependent on the revenues from a growing industrial sector. And what's happened is, is either by grand design or benign neglect, the, uh, the industrial sector of our economy has atrophied over the last 40 years. And the question is, do we do something about it or do we let it continue to happen? But I would suggest that when you have a government dependent on a growing, dynamic industrial sector, and then when you lose that, it's no wonder that you lose revenues and that we're struggling now to figure out a way to pay the bills of this grand design state government that we created with, 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 with the, the revenues from, a, from an industrial society, from an industrial economy. So I think that's, that's, that's you know, and that's another place that we, I think where labor and, and business should be working together. Mike Jimenez and I, and C, Cal, pr President of the uh, uh, California Correctional Peace Officers Association and CMPA <laughs> have been engaged over the years on, on, um, uh, on um, workforce training and career and technical education in our high schools. This year, the Labor Federation and CMTA are co-sponsoring a bill to make sure that the WIBs spend a specific amount of their available do dollars on workforce training. We've worked together on the, on the Dizalne bill, as, as Sarah, Sarah, Sarah mentioned. And I think there's a realization there that if we don't create a growing <coughs> economy in the state, especially for the public sector unions, there's not going to be any money there to pay pensions. There's not going to be money there to pay increased benefits or increased salaries in the future. And I think that's a very high point of, 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 of potential here of working together. And I think we have worked with, with CCPOA and the, the uh, construct, Building Construction, Construction Trades Council and, and, and as, as I said, the Labor Federation. And I think there, there's a, a willingness to, to try to find more ways to work together to fix this. Our problem is we need action right now. We really need something to shock us into to, to reality. The second chart you have, there's a, there's a magazine called Site Selection Magazine, and all of you economic development folks know that. It's uh, a national publication owned by Conway Data. They track all of the industrial, industrial startups and expansions nationwide, and they report those. We saw that they, they report them in their magazine. We went back and bought a lot of their past data so that we could develop some, some charts here. But what this first chart shows is, and we manipulated it a bit, what we did is we took, they, they report the number of startups and expansions per state. And then what we did is we divided that into the, the, the population of each state so we'd be able to get the number of startups and expansions per million residents over the four-year period. This is 2007 to 2010. During that period, California received 4.8 per million residents, 4.8 expansions or, or, or startups. The national average was 40. So businesses, the, 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 the fact that we, we heard here earlier that 
that businesses are looking past California because of our, our negative business, business image is in fact true. I mean, you, we, we are one-tenth of what the national average is in, in startup constructions, and we, we should be high, higher. Cal California is, uh, you know, the, the largest industrial state in the country still. Even, even with, with the losses we've suffered, we're still the largest industrial state in the country. I'm not sure that we'll keep that for all, very long if we don't, uh, don't turn ourselves around. The next chart is the same type of data, only they looked at how much was invested by each company. And so we got a you get total investment, and, we, and then we did that per capita. So California over the, and this is a three year because 2010 numbers weren't ready yet. So this is three year, 2010 to 2009. Mm -hmm. California got $235 of industrial investment per citizen. The national average was 1,335. So we're getting, uh, I don't know the percentage on that. We're not getting our, nearly our fair share of, uh, of the industrial investment. And then the final chart I'd point your uh, attention to in the back. Laura Lee, you, uh, use different numbers on total U.S. Um, uh, venture capital. What we looked at is, and we obviously have different sources, but this is the, from the source we have. This is three five-year periods looking at venture capital versus industrial investment in California. And as you can see, California receives the lion's share of venture capital, 41 percent in the 95 to 99 period, 42 percent in the 2000 to 2004 period, and 48% in the uh, 2005 to 2009 period. Unfortunately, what has happened is, is if you look at the smaller columns beside each of those large columns, the uh, percentage of, of industrial investment in, ca in California has been shrinking from 7.7 .7 during the late 90s, which still wasn't enough to sustain us, <laughs> down to 1.3% uh, in the most recent five years. So we're getting the lion's share of the, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, venture capital but we're not getting our, we're not getting, hard, we're hardly getting any of the of, of the, uh, the the middle class jobs that go with it. And I think what's happened is, and this is kind of my theory, is that after the tech bubble burst uh, of the, uh, in 2000 2001, what happened was is that high tech companies figured that they could manufacture more cheaply in Asia. And I think what's happened is is the venture capital community has has moved forward with that. The idea you innovate here, develop products that are, that are, that are needed here and, and, and desired here in the United States, then you immediately go to Asia for production where you create the, the, the jobs. And, 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 I, and I hesitate to call them middle class jobs anymore because they're not middle, what we consider middle class jobs. And then they market back to California. And I think that's a real problem. I and mean, we, we always hear about all the venture capital that's coming in California. And I don't want to say that it's bad. It, it's good that we get it. But we need to find a formula to keep that here. Because what's happened is, is our high-tech manufacturing jobs, which were a decade in, in the 1990s, middle-class jobs here in California in the United States, have become low-wage jobs <laughs> in, in Asia. And the question is, is how do you, and I don't have an answer for this, the question is, how do you bring those jobs back here? Is, or is it possible to bring those jobs back here and have companies still have competitive products? And I think the, the uh, clean technology uh, sector is now following that same path. You innovate here, scale up someplace else, and then, manu and, and, and then market back to California. So I think that th there, there's some real challenges ahead for us. I would, you know, I applaud the committee for, for taking the time today to, to hear us out on, on, on these issues. Uh, that I am somewhat encouraged uh, Senator Steinberg and uh, Senator Calderon are working on a, um, on a reg reform bill that they're going to try to move before the end of session. I'm hopeful that there's going to be enough good stuff in there that we're, we're all able to, 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 to unite around it and, and to look at it as a, as, a, as a signal. But if we don't send, I mean, with, with California getting so little of the industrial investment right now, that is just further, further proof from my perspective that the business, uh, the investors around the country and around the world are not looking to California as a, play, a good place to invest their money. And we need, some sh we, we need to shock those people. <laughs> back into wanting to invest in California. Nibbling around the edges on some issues are not, is not what's going to do it. We have to send a bold signal. And I think the two things that we can do is, one, create a, a, a statewide gover governor's office level office of economic development. Go ahead. I appreciate what they do. They do not have the leadership out of the governor's office and that, 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 it, that is needed. It, need, it needs to be, as, as, as Wayne said, either the governor or one of his top lieutenants 
who are pushing economic development. Uh, in March, uh, Lieutenant Governor Newsom, uh, Assemblywoman Grove, and Assemblyman uh, Morrell, and I, and, and other legislators, went to Texas to meet with Governor Perry. And one of the things that, that I learned from that is that he is the quarterback of the economic development team. When he had economic troubles, state budget troubles in the early 2000s, he said, we're not going to tax our way out of this, we're going to grow our way out of this. Moved the economic development office into his office, he became the general, or his, as he said, the quarterback, and, uh, and has done a very good job. I mean, we, we can all argue whether the jobs are good jobs, middle class jobs, or low wage jobs, but the fact is they've created the jobs and they've created the atmosphere of economic growth. That's what California needs. I believe we have everything here uh, to do that. We have had it in the past, except the desire and the will to do it. Uh, many of the things that, that, that Julian talked about as barriers to investment and barriers to growth, unfortunately, are trophies that other groups, labor, environmentalists, uh, consumer groups, have on their wall. It's not easy just to say we're going to fix all these things, because we, in order to fix something, you're going against some, a, a, a trophy that somebody else has won in the past. But that's why I think that we have to find a common ground that we can circle around. And as I said, I think that should be the Lieutenant Governor's plan. Bring everybody into a room and figure out how we're going to do this and how we're going to make, create jobs for California. So we, we all talk about creating jobs. But we've done very little to move the ball forward in California this year. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Stewart. Uh, if I may, I'll take maybe a, a few minutes to raise some questions and some thoughts and you know, open it up to all of you uh, to answer the questions or to give you some feedback. But one in, in specific, and, and perhaps this is for, for Sarah and for Mr. Stewart as well as others here in our panel, is pertaining to uh, the issue of manufacturing. But uh, Sarah, you mentioned something earlier about targeting manufacturing, right? And uh, I, I'd like to know more about what that means for you uh, what that may mean for you, Mr. Stewart, as well. But on the other end of this, because as I look at your slide, your second slide, specifically California's growth in manufacturing capacity is far below the national average, right? And I'm looking at Kentucky at 115.8 uh, New York expanded facilities, right? Uh, and we're dead last, right? I guess my, the other side of that, my question is, what are the labor standards uh, in those states, right? What does that look like over there? Um, and can there be some sort of balance as to making sure that we have um, continuously work to have uh, labor standards that are important for us, for our, our, our you know, what we stand for as, as folks, making sure that people have, you know, a good salary, making sure that people have uh, benefits, uh, making sure that ultimately at the end of the day they're able to take care of their families. Uh, we know that they're able to do that, then there's less reliance on social programs. And so, on one end, can, what would those uh, incentives or that targeting of manufacturing look like, and is there a reason why that's connected to labor standards, or maybe the lack thereof, I don't know, in other states as to why they're growing? Uh, so just a question, an open question. Yeah. Oh, happy to. Um, in terms of Targeting manufacturing, I think this goes back to the comments I had at the beginning, where California has a lot of resources and a lot of assets. We have a skilled workforce. Um, we have infrastructure. We have, you know, an education system. We have the UCs. And I think if there's, if the state is going to put together a plan and then bring our tools, our toolbox of economic development, our tax breaks, our everything that we have to bear, um, then there should be you know, it should be looked at what, what's the kind of manufacturing we want to bring in and how are we going to do it. And just as the same way as looking at the different um, clusters that we have, the regional clusters and regional economies, and how do we, so how does the state support growth in those areas? I mean, Michigan is a good example. That was a, a union state um, that had very good middle class jobs, and they're looking at what are their existing assets and what can they do with that? And so with their smart zone program, they only target four manufacturing areas. One of them is advanced manufacturing. There's life sciences. There's, I believe, alternative energy. And the smart zones give kind of comprehensive support. It 
does include a tax credit, but the tax credit only goes to companies that are in these specific areas, advanced manufacturing, life sciences, alternative energy. Um, it links them up with universities, so there's kind of um, an innovation cluster. Um, they have Michigan Invest, which can help with some of the financing. It's kind of a complete package, rather than the scattershot effect, which we have right now in California, where anyone can take a tax break and we don't know what they do with it, and there's no transparency, and there's no accountability, and there's no upfront expectations. They have the reverse. There's upfront expectations. It only goes to certain um, industries, and there's, there's goals that they meet. So I think there's, there's things that the state can do in terms of taking the tools and resources we have and making them more effective when we deploy them. And it would be up to whoever is making this plan to decide, well, what are those industries that we want to bring in? I just think that we, we have a chance in the state of California to do high road um, development rather than a race to the bottom because we're going to lose the race to the bottom. I mean, California is just not a state that's going to compete with China or with a right to work state. And so since we're starting from a higher level in terms of our standards, we need to think about what's the development that fits in best with that um, to reduce a lot of the friction. So, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would agree that it's <coughs> difficult to, to, for California to compete with some of the right to states in the South. I mean, that's where you're seeing a lot of the uh, industrial growth right now is in the South. But on the other hand, for, for, for high-tech advanced manufacturing, and I, I you know, sometimes I, 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 I kind of recoil at the use of the term advanced manufacturing. Because California, being a high cost state, that we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 percent more costly in operating costs than other states, we have, I would argue, the most efficient, productive workforce in the world. If, if, if our companies aren't productive, aren't efficient, they're not here anymore. They, they've already, the, the, those who aren't efficient have already gone or to, to, to Asia or to, uh, to another state. So I think really that, that, that advanced manufacturing is, is a nice term, but the fact is, is most of what we already do is very highly efficient advanced manufacturing. There's very little um, low-tech um, uh, manufacturing done in California anymore. That's just, just, just a fact. You know, when you're looking at the, the, the criteria for what it takes to be successful in manufacturing, we've worked with our members to put together a list of five, five criteria, predictable costs, uh, competitive cost, two different things, competitive cost, adequate infrastructure, access to a skilled workforce, and regulatory certainty. And, you know, when you go down that list, California is, it, it, it's hard to make the argument that, we're, that, that we meet any of those criteria. I mean, a, a man manufacturer who is manu investing for the long term, looking out 5, 10, or 15 years, and they look at California with our, with our uh, unstable ballot, uh, state bu budget with a set of regulatory agencies that just are spewing out <laughs> regulations. I mean, uh, just, just, just what we're looking at just right now, uh, AB 32, that's not finalized. We don't know what that's going to cost us yet. We have the green chemistry initiative that's out there. We don't know what that's going to mean yet for, for manufacturers. You have the stormwater runoff regulations that are out there right now. What's that going to mean? We've just had a, for some of our companies, the Chromium 6 uh, 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 criteria that has just been released is going to make it impossible for some of our companies to continue to, to operate in California. So all of those things at a time when we should be looking at how do we make attract businesses here, we still have this, this, this set of, of unpredictable, uncertain regulatory costs that, that are coming with us that other states have tried to figure a way to, 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 to balance out. And that, that's, we, we, we don't, have a qualm with, a, with, with, with the green economy or the renewable energy, our only qualm with that is, is the rapidity with which we, with which we get there uh, and the cost, that, 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 the cost that, that entails to get there in 2020 or 2030 versus 2040 or 2050. I think that's, that's, that's where our, 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 our rub is. I mean, we hear all these reports. I think the Brookings Institute did a study recently. I think they have the most recent one on green jobs in California with 300 some odd thousand. Uh, what, what I, the, the problem I find with those studies is, is you're just looking at green jobs and in many cases re, re, redefining jobs that are already there. For instance, transit, transit uh, uh, drivers are now considered green jobs. Well, a bus driver has been a bus driver for the last you know, 80 or 90 years. Uh, a, a stock boy who puts the um, cardboard box, takes a box, cans out of the box, 
puts a box in a recycle bin, he's now part of the green, green, green economy, green, a green worker. I mean, I think we have to have some honesty there. And then when you look at some of the higher level workers, uh, you have to understand, did we kill other jobs in the economy in order to get those? What is the trade-off? And I think we, that's, that's a term I use. It's hard. To, I use net new jobs. How many real jobs did you create in the green economy if you, you're, you're killing jobs in other places in order to finance and, and subsidize those jobs? I well, appreciate your points uh, from both of you. Uh, I guess the reason why I'm raising the question, obviously I am trying to think through how we could um, target uh, our efforts, uh, however we define that, to ensure that manufacturing, uh, those that are currently here, uh, continue to stay here. Um, and then those that left or are not here, we can figure out a way to, to bring them. Um, but I also wanted to see the, perhaps how labor standards or the lack thereof, perhaps, I don't, I'm not sure, in other states, what do they look like? Because does that play a role um, with relation to uh, those states uh, being able to take manufacturing from our state? I know for a fact it, it has a major role in Mexico, in China. Right? The standards out there are nearly non-existent. Right? There, there is no a minimum wage uh, in Mexico. Uh, and you have uh, environmental standards that are almost uh, very minimal, that are very minimal. And so uh, I guess that was my, my point that I'm trying to make. I'm trying to figure out what, what do those labor standards actually look like in other states? Um, and ultimately, are individuals in those states, uh, do they have the quality of life that we have here? I'm not sure. Uh, so I just wanted to raise that point. Um, a question as well for perhaps uh, Ms. Martin uh, as well as Mr. Uh, Canete, uh, or a thought, and, and you can help me think through this. Uh, we, you mentioned uh, innovation and technology and, and, and digitizing pedagogy, if you will in the classrooms, which I can agree with. Um, has there been an effort as to how technology uh, innovation can support uh, our current small businesses that exist in the state of California? What does that look like? Uh, you know, what, what type of uh, programs or processes uh, is there collaboration uh, between our small business community uh, and, for example, uh, your entity, uh, Ms. Mara, and the California Council on Science and Technology to ensure that ultimately our small businesses have every single tool that they need so that they're successful. Just a, a question, a thought, and perhaps uh, you can help me sure. understand um, that. When we did the um, thought leaders around the innovation strategy, it did include small business people in the discussions. Um, but they were focused again back on education and water as bigger statewide issues. I'd say in general, though, that we're seeing the um, small businesses migrating to the technologies on their own. You see a big push in the healthcare and medical records, of course, but you start to look um, at the small shops who are doing their accounting and doing their internet purchasing or selling and things like that. So we aren't working specifically with small businesses other than the ones that came together with us on the innovation ecosystem, I'd say, where they're looking at how the state, what the state can be doing to help them. And there was absolutely no comment made as to what they needed in their businesses. So they were looking at uh, bigger issues. I think they're solving some of that on their own, and there's SBDC centers around the state that start to help with some of that in incubators and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chair, I'm going to give you a couple examples of what we're doing right now. Of course, we, we, we've, we've teamed up with the California uh, Emerging Technologies Fund, which is headed up by um, Sunny McPeak, um, and CARAT, the California Resources Training um, Group, and, and the California State Hispanic Chambers. Uh, we've teamed up on a broadband initiative just recently, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we just finished our first cycle of 10 webinars. Um, and so those include everything from, you know, financial management online to, uh, I think the last session I just, I chimed in real quick was on uh, procure, uh, supply management, chain management. You know, how, how do you manage your supply chain as a small business owner via the internet? So, so we are working with the technology groups and in, in, in getting that technology out to, to our small businesses. You know, a couple of years ago, we did a broadband uh, 
uh, utilization survey of our small businesses. We surveyed about uh, 3,000 Hispanic-owned businesses, about 500 African-American-owned businesses, and about 800 Asian-owned businesses um, throughout the state. And one of the things we found out was, as, as Laura Lee was saying, she was, I would hope everybody has broadband. Um, you know, one of the things we found out was not everybody had broadband <laughs> business-wise, you know. Um, there are some still in the state, some accessibility issues. But one of the things we found out was that uh, many of our business owners had broadband technology, but what they viewed broadband technology as was email. Yeah. And, okay, now I have a website, so that's my broadband technology. So what, we, what came out of that was we found underutilization of, of, of broadband technology, and, and this is where we started rolling it into now these 10 programs uh, that we're doing online uh, with our businesses. We also do them physically as well, so. Well, I appreciate that, and earlier you mentioned uh, issues pertaining to procurement and state contracts, right, and specific to minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, uh, folks that perhaps are disabled. Uh, is there any way or is, that, is there an effort now uh, underway uh, in which technology can be utilized for procurement uh, when it comes to state contracts for these type of businesses? Uh, well, I, know of we, broadband. I, I know broadband plays a big right. role, but. I know we've been working uh, with DGS. You know, there's now for the small businesses to be able on, on, on a lot of the um, procurement opportunities to bid electronically. They're moving in that area. Uh, you can pull up the uh, contracts electronically. I know we were just working with the utilities under the GO-156 order in, in seeing ways that we can put more of the contract, the business opportunities online so businesses can have better access to them out there. Mr. Chair, we have also been doing the same thing. There's a number of technologies out there that are available that can connect small businesses to uh, um, to the um, to the community and their needs in government contracting. In fact, we have one that we operate with. Uh, um, we've been doing it in a number of communities. Eureka is a good example. Um, these are these are technologies that are already there that can be used to marry up and match uh, companies to opportunity and that kind of thing. So that it, the, I think the technology is out there to some extent. It just hasn't really been brought to the front like it probably should you know agencies like Caltrans and others might want to step up and do a better job of identifying those technologies we have a lot of communities that need connections we can connect businesses to businesses already in those communities there's a couple of national programs that already do that so would you say mr. Shaw, uh, Julian uh, miss Martin all of you that are here on the panel that perhaps the tools do exist and perhaps we can create newer tools but there are tools that already exist. Is it maybe um, the issue is uh, the knowledge that they exist, the lack right. thereof? A lot of times that is the problem. And perhaps even not having the ability, uh, the understanding to manipulate those tools for that matter. Right. right. Um, we had a program called Tools for Business Success. It was a fabulous little uh, software program created by a lady who used to work for the chamber and community colleges and stuff. And, and uh, we picked up on it thinking, boy, this would be really great if, uh, what if we put this, uh, this database in every city hall in California? Well, that was probably our mistake. We were selling at a very, very small cost, like 1200 bucks a year to have this on your, on your website. The problem is, is businesses don't go to city hall to look for opportunity. Sure. Should have been every chamber in the state should have picked this up. They didn't. I don't know why. I don't know why that doesn't happen. I mean, it's just a simple education process, getting information to people and letting them know it's there sometimes is the issue often. Sure. Well, I definitely want to make sure that we uh, continue to grow procurement opportunities uh, for our small businesses. Uh, and I do think that an avenue for that is through uh, technology and through innovative tools that already exist. But perhaps this is all linked as well to uh, AB 29. Um, and the Office of Economic Development. Um, and this is, a, I guess, a question uh, for, for Mr. Allen and for yourself, Mr. Shaw, and, and others on the panel as well. Um, what else is needed that was brought up earlier uh, that perhaps could, could help us be more focused uh, and ensure that uh, our business community uh, is thriving? Uh, and ensure that ultimately uh, that there is one portal or one entity where folks can go to 
uh, and there's no confusion or at least uh, minimal confusion. Um, so an open-ended question, um, but I wanted to raise that as well. It comes from the governor. I'm sorry? Governor, it comes from the governor. If he says he wants to do it, it gets done. It's very simple in my mind. He has to say he wants to do it. He has to tell his staff he wants to do it. He has to make it a very high priority for them. This office won't be, won't, will only be as good as the governor stands behind it when they need it. That office in the governor's office, there's a reason for that. The reason is we've had departments, we've had agencies. We've been there, done that. We grew lots of bureaucracy in those departments and agencies. We need something more flexible, more nimble, more something with real experienced people in that office. We need to have a budget for that office. By the way, we pass a bill, we're going to have to have a budget for it, aren't we? They're operating on a shoestring over there. They're using other positions from other departments. It's scandalous in my book that we're doing that kind of thing. So it starts with the governor in my book. He has to step up and say, I'm taking this office. We're going to make it function. By the way, we're now adding an office back to the governor's office. I wonder how that will fare. You know, I see that as an investment, though. I don't see it as a cost. I see it as investing in the future of California. That office doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be 40, 50, 100 people to start with. It can start small, be focused. You know what? Let's focus on manufacturing. Let's make it simple. Strategy doesn't have to be everything. Mm -hmm. Let's just focus on something. Let's say that we want to save manufacturing in California. That's the first priority for this governor. Let's figure out how to go do that, Mr. Chair. Put an enterprise zone on top of every manufacturer in California. I mean, you want to get really wild about this kind of thing. Why? Why? Because we're trying to grow that sector. Why do they have to move anywhere? Why don't we just grow them where they're at? That kind of thing. Th that kind of thinking can come to the table if we get focused on something specific. I'm sorry. Sure. No, that's right. It, it does require that leadership not only from the governor, but the lieutenant governor, the speaker, the Senate president, the members of the legislature. It requires consistent leadership across the state where nobody's working to resist the leadership of others uh, to get this many disparate agencies and offices working together in a concerted way. There are a lot of resources available in the state, at the state level, at the federal level, at the local level, that all exist in silos, and the businesses don't know how to access them. Sarah showed you that chart of economic development resources in the state, and to professionals in the field. We can't figure out how to navigate it. So someone's got to get together and say, there's two million people out of work in this state. We've got deficits that we're struggling to balance. We're cutting public services. We're challenging our very quality of life in this state because we're not getting this piece right. For whatever all our other differences are, we've all got to come together and say we're going to fix this piece. This is eminently fixable. This isn't brain surgery. This isn't rocket science. This can be fixed. There are examples of other states fixing it. There are examples of other cities and regions and nations fixing it. We can do this. We have the technology. We're the innovators and creators of this technology in this state. If we in California can't utilize our technology resources to put all these pieces of information and services on one platform that are easily accessible by the customer, nobody can do it. That office, by the way, Mr. Perez, that, that office, uh, uh, <laughs> it should not be siloed ever again. Mm -hmm. We siloed the last bunch of departments and agencies. We created an office of tourism, an office of small business, an office of research, an office of international trade, an office of this, and an office of that. Everybody had an office, including me, who worked for one of those offices under Jerry Brown when he was first the governor, okay? I had the Office of Local Economic Development. We all had our little silos to play in, okay? None of us played together very well. We all had our little silos. Mm -hmm. Everybody was appointed by the governor, so we didn't have to answer to anybody except the governor, quite frankly. We don't want that again. It was wrong. I helped create that when it was created. Mm -hmm. It was created in response to a problem. It was the wrong way to do it. We had no strategy. The strategy was a bar napkin. You know, let's figure out how to save the governor because he's in trouble with the business community. And a bunch of us sat down and wrote it out. And, and uh, I got my job and someone else got his job, quite frankly. That, that's the wrong way to do it. It didn't work. This office should be small, nimble, experts dedicated to specific industries. You have an industry that you want to save called biotech, I'd have someone in that office that knows biotech upside down and inside out so that when we had a problem, we know exactly how to deal with it with respect to other agencies. I'd appoint an ED person in every key department, a point person, existing high-level staff, deputy 
department director, you're now also the economic development person for this department. We're going to be looking to you to help us access what's going on in the department and what our needs are. That would be part of our overall resource staff. That would, that's a little bit of what's going on already through GOED. So there's plenty of little things we can do to make all of this move forward quickly, but that office is really critical. It's really critical and it can't be outside the governor. It has, to, when you call up another department and you say, I'm from the governor's office, that's a big difference than when you say, I'm from business transportation and housing agency and I'd like to talk to somebody else. Mm -hmm. No one answers. Sure, well, well thank you Mr. Shell. I know that we're almost near uh, out of time. I, I did have one last question that I just wanted to raise, and this perhaps is for Mr. Allen, uh, but as well uh, for Ms. Flox and obviously others in the panel. Uh, you brought up uh, quite a bit of issues pertaining to regulation uh, and other issues as well that are important, uh, vocational education, an effort there uh, that perhaps it's uh, that we, you know, we're lacking a strategic plan for the state of California. Uh, but you also mentioned CEQA reform. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to get into that discussion, uh, if possible. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that look like? What does that mean to you? Right? And what does that mean to labor as well as to the business community? Right? Uh, what does that mean for the manufacturing uh, community as well as the small business community? Uh, what does that mean for those that are in innovation and technology? Right? Uh, what does that mean, for that matter, for uh, if AB 29 passes the Office of Economic Development. Um, can we go there? Uh, I think we can. I think we need to go there. But uh, I think many times, though, uh, we don't have perhaps uh, the specific, uh, precise uh, details as to how CEQA is perhaps negatively impacting our communities. Um, and so, just kind of open-ended question, just wanted to raise it and see uh, what your thoughts are on that. The focus from our organization is on the abuses of CEQA, not weakening its environmental protections at all, but those who would seek to use that Environmental Quality Act for purposes other than environmental benefit, for, as I mentioned, uh, preventing competition from their business, for green mail processes. There are hundreds, probably thousands of examples in this state of projects initiated by the private sector as well as the public sector that have not moved forward at all because of these abuses. There are projects that have been delayed. In a meeting just the other morning, one of our LA County supervisors <laughs> talked about the simple improvement of the shell at the Hollywood Bowl under which the musicians perform took two extra years and cost 25% more than it should have to simply refurbish that shell than, than it otherwise would have because of uh, frivolous lawsuits that were really green mail uh, attempts. Uh, we have student housing at our universities that can't get built because small individual apartment owners around those universities want to keep those students living in those small individual housing units as opposed to building modern, competitive, safe, affordably priced housing for the students built by the universities or built by private developers near the universities. We have hospital uh, improvements that aren't being built. We have manufacturing facilities that aren't being built. We have solar facilities that aren't being built. Our goals as a state to green our economy are being threatened by uh, the abuses of CEQA. So there are a number of ideas put on the table by people that would talk about uh, limiting private attorney general rights. Uh, there, there's a whole series of ideas that are too lengthy for us to go into at this particular meeting, but we could share with you some of the ones that have come up through our organization and some of the ones that seem to be finding common ground among various interests. I think the private sector labor community is very excited about the prospect of this reform because so much of construction is organized in this state, and there are many, many, many opportunities for organized labor that are not moving forward. Again, whether they're government-sponsored, private-sponsored, or, or uh, non-profit-sponsored development projects or public-private projects that are not moving forward because of either active CEQA litigation or the fear of CEQA litigation, I think it would be a tremendous boost uh, to the real estate and construction sector, which is the hardest hit sector in the state. There's something on the order of 300,000 construction workers in the state who are out of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and this kind of thing holds it up. By the way, recently, uh, with the help of, of the Assembly and others, uh, we were able to get the State Office of Healthcare Planning and Development, OSHPOD, to exempt some of its workers from furloughs and, and hiring freezes. And that is beginning to unlock some of the hospital improvements that were held back, that were 
denying thousands of construction workers an opportunity to go back to work improving our health care facilities, we see an even greater potential with SEQA reform to put literally tens if not hundreds of thousands of construction workers back to work much sooner and more broadly throughout the state if we can reform this act in a way that continues to preserve our environment. It's a noble act in a noble state that prioritizes environmental quality, but it has been abused by people for other purposes. That's all we're talking about eliminating. Sure. I can appreciate that. Any other thoughts from well, panelists? Yeah, from a manufacturer standpoint, we haven't had a lot of expansion lately, so CEQA hasn't been, you know, right at the top of our agenda. But I think, you know, a general statement is, is you have to put some finality to the process. You can't allow the, allow the process to continue on and on. It's, at some point, it's, it's game over, appeals have been made, get on with the project. Hmm. Finality to the, the CEQA process, because right now it's just too open-ended. Yes, Ms. Martin? Just want to add one more comment. Um, looking at it, from the public agency side where CEQA hits that, I'd say in my own professional experience, I've watched um, internal opinions um, belabor or increase the CEQA. Um, so it's sort of uh, a self-created burden. And also sometimes the level of risk an agency or an organization is willing to take weighs into the cost and the time related to CEQA. So there is a, a public agency side of this that could be looked at as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll try to find the article, but, uh, you know, Mr. Allen alluded to the, you know, fear, frivolous, frivolous actions taken. There was an incident, it hadn't, didn't have to do with business, but I think it's appropriate for here, where they actually used CEQA to hold up a fireworks show. I think in La Jolla it was. Uh, they actually filed to, 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 because it said it had an environmental impact on something. Mm -hmm. So, but I'll find the article and forward it over to you. Yeah, and, and I raise a point not because I, and I agree with Mr. Allen, not, not because I don't agree with the fact that we need to protect the quality of life of our communities as well as the environment, uh, but I raise it because I do think, though, that we do have an imbalance. Um, and as we're moving forward in the recovery of our state, we do have to really think through uh, how, uh, for example, CEQA regulations have been abused. Um, and as a result have negatively impacted our economy. Um, but that requires a longer conversation. And I just want to say uh, thank you to all our panelists. Uh, you were um, very gracious with your time. And as well, uh, I learned a lot. I'm sure that many other members, although perhaps they're not here today, uh, physically, they're watching. And the state is watching. And, and I uh, wanted to make sure that I thank you all for being here. And I also want to say that I will be uh, calling uh, a meeting of the generals, uh, if you will. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm part of the general hood, but uh, I definitely will be asking to bring together uh, the leadership uh, to have a conversation, uh, and not only to have a conversation, but to think through a strategy and an action plan um, because I think we've been going uh, too long uh, without that, uh, knowing that uh, we are now in a global economy and we're having to compete with other nation states, uh, other countries, uh, our neighbors uh, that surround us uh, here locally as well. Uh, we need to uh, work together and we do need not to work in silos and see if we can bring um, all our minds, our souls, our hearts uh, to the table to see what the next plan is going to look like for the state of California. So with that, be expecting a letter that's perhaps going to be going out to you within the next few weeks, and uh, we're going to do our due diligence with our Senate Pro Tem, with our speaker, with the governor, with the lieutenant governor. Uh, that's what I heard uh, from all of you, uh, and so look out for that letter. Thank you, panelists, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And as the panelists are, are moving on, this is now the time for public comment. I'm not sure if we have uh, anyone no. signed up for public comment. All right. Well, thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, and on behalf of the Committee on Jobs, Economic Development, and the Economy, I want to thank the committee members that were present, as well as all of you witnesses that provided testimony and that participated in this hearing and this meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>